Hi there. My name is Stan Blade, Dean of the Faculty of Agricultural, Life and Environmental Sciences here at the University of Alberta, located in our provincial capital, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. It's a great pleasure to be with you to have a conversation about agricultural literacy, literacy and of course, to talk about the things that are coming out of this uh, discussion in our live panel that will follow these presentations. Certainly like to thank the organizers uh, to the IAAS, uh, to Professor Lee and the entire team uh, for asking me to be a participant and to uh, collaborate on all of the elements that we are starting to think about with respect to agricultural liter literacy. And of course, the role that all of this will play in the successful completion of our sustainable development goals within the United Nations. What we have here is a complete discussion about what it is that needs to happen when it comes to ag literacy. Now, it's important for you to understand a little bit about uh, what it is that uh, I'm uh, doing when it comes to all of this uh, work. Uh, again, great to be uh, here and uh, addressing this topic. Uh, but who am I in, uh, in this conversation? Uh, I grew up as a farm kid here in the province of Alberta. I worked internationally within the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, primarily focused in the uh, parts of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, but working across the world as a plant breeder, uh, eventually as a deputy director general. Uh, and now I have the great uh, pleasure um, working within the University of Alberta with uh, a tremendous group of people within the faculty. Uh, and I will have a few more words to say about that uh, in a moment. Now, you've just seen a picture show up there. You've probably worked out that the acronym of our faculty name is AILS. And when we celebrated our centennial in 2015, uh, we actually had our colleagues at one of our local breweries develop Ales Ale uh, that became part of the celebrations that we have been involved with. So just as a reminder of where we sit and uh, how our province uh, uh, fits into the, the grand scheme of things, you will see that we are based in Western Canada. Alberta is extremely fortunate in having a large resource base. Uh, um, in 2021, our GDP was just over $320 billion Canadian, and that was driven by uh, our very important industrial sectors. We have a significant conventional oil and gas industry. We have a major agriculture and food sector here in the province of Alberta. And we also have uh, a major forestry sector uh, based on uh, uh, our natural resources and the activities that we have going on within the province. So just gives you a little sense of the province of Alberta, the role that it plays. Uh, and of course, uh, I have to include tourism in there. I hope maybe you've participated uh, by touring into the Rocky Mountains of Banff and Jasper. And of course, you're always welcome uh, to visit us here uh, in what we think is a very beautiful province. So where do we stand at the University of Alberta? We are a top 100 uh, research intensive university, uh, usually ranked top four in Canada for the work that we do across all of our areas. We are a university of a significant student population, almost 40,000 students. Uh, and we are very involved again in the industrial activities uh, of, the, uh, of the province, but we also have a footprint that, that uh, expands out to Canada and to the rest of the world. Just to give you some sense of the details, uh, our university was founded in 1908. <clears throat> we have several faculties and a significant number of campuses. We have now almost 40,000 students, uh, both undergraduate and graduate programs uh, uh, across the University of Alberta, a very comprehensive, a very uh, 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 research intensive uh, group uh, that's looking into all of the major issues uh, that are facing us uh, across the globe. 
Uh, we have had a significant investment in new buildings and new facilities, uh, and we are very excited about the role that academics can play uh, in collaboration with government, with the private sector, with civil society uh, that allows us to do the important things that we do. Just a further discussion with respect to Alberta's agri-food sector. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, almost uh, 15 billion Canadian uh, that's generated for producers in this province. Uh, all of these uh, uh, figures are in Canadian dollars. But we also have um, a very uh, appropriate uh, a part of the spectrum when it comes to the agri-food sector on processing. So food and beverages, again, you can see uh, above uh, $16 billion. So we are not only primary producers, but we are also very focused on the opportunities associated with adding value to the products that we have. Uh, so it gives you a sense also of the agri-food exports uh, that this province produces. Uh, to put that in some context, uh, the Canadian agri-food export numbers are usually in the range of just above $80 billion. Uh, so Alberta uh, uh, certainly makes a major contribution to that uh, because of the uh, both extensive agriculture that we have in a province with almost 25 million hectares uh, dedicated to agriculture, both in crop and animal production. Uh, alongside of uh, just a tremendous group of highly qualified people, starting right from producers all the way through to the technical people that are associated with our processing industry. Uh, so this is a key uh, industry for us. It's the kind of industry that our faculty is very interested in supporting. <clears throat> so what about our faculty? Uh, we're very proud of the work that we do here within uh, the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences. You can see the four key areas that we concentrate on. Uh, we have a, approximately 1,800 undergraduate students, uh, about 600 graduate students within our faculty. Uh, and every year we're somewhere between 45 and million dollars of external research funding, uh, which we certainly see as people, industries, governments and other groups betting with their dollars, investing with us uh, to solve some of those very wicked problems, to pursue new opportunities uh, that uh, are in place when we come to think about the agriculture and food sector. More, more, just a bit more detail of how that works within our faculty. We have all of the disciplinary expertise that connects agriculture to food, to nutrition, to human health. And we do that also on disciplinary expertise on a platform of work in soils and water, <clears throat> excuse me, and biodiversity. <clears throat> so what we see uh, is that we have all of the various uh, areas of expertise to create uh, interesting research and innovation opportunities uh, to do all of the necessary work uh, to provide the answers for uh, the kinds of things that uh, all of our partners and collaborators are looking for. Now, we have talked specifically about how ag literacy will build into the successful uh, reaching of our sustainable development goals. I'm sure you know them very well, but of course, number two, we think about a great deal around zero hunger, but obviously ending poverty, the number one goal, fits into all of the other elements of the SDGs. And I'm just gonna refer to the broad array of, F of SDGs in discussing agricultural literacy, but I think it's important for us to realize that there are specific elements and specific opportunities, but I'm, I'm sure all of you can make a connection in the agri-food space and spectrum to the successful reaching of these goals uh, as they are articulated uh, uh, from the United Nations and how countries across the world have started to work towards. So let's talk a little bit about ag literacy. Why do we need to be concerned about ag literacy? I think sometimes we may forget uh, that there are reasons why uh, we have put this forward as a very specific opportunity and something that presents a, a bit of a burning platform. 
So let's talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, the aspects uh, that I've laid out on this slide. Of course, in our case, less than 2% of Canadians are actually involved in primary agricultural production. The days of people having family members that were involved in production agriculture or people even living in rural environments where production agriculture was a key industry, those days are gone in Canada and I suspect in many of the countries in which you live. Um, so it's created that little bit of a gap with respect to knowing the people that are involved in primary agriculture and the kinds of opportunities uh, that people are pursuing as new ideas, as new innovations come into play. So a much smaller subset of people involved in the industry, and that has implications for how people understand agriculture and food, and perhaps, and I will already start to give you a sense of where I'm going in my conclusions, how we develop a sense of trust within the work that we do so that people are comfortable and actually understand why it is that we are making the choices that we make within the agri-food sector. Second of all, people have an opinion because they are obviously consumers of food. I know that we've just passed the 8 billion person mark here on earth. Uh, I've certainly heard it people say, say, and I will use it in this context, that if there are 8 billion people on the globe, there are 8 billion opinions about food. Everyone has ideas about food. They have uh, internal memories. It's part of their personal experience. Uh, this is not something that people will just keep to the side. It's, it's part of their personal experience. It's part of their personal values. And of course, that means that if people don't have a sense of, of ag literacy and some of the, the key uh, evidence and understanding about how our food system works, um, that these deeply held opinions uh, can lead to some, some very complicated outcomes. So certainly another reason why we need to focus on agricultural literacy. The third is just talking about the fact that our agri-food system is complicated. We've seen over the last 30 months the issues around supply chains when it comes to food. We produce food across the world. We produce ingredients across the world. Things are moving in very many uh, different ways. Companies are, are, are collaborating. There's an elaborate regulatory and, and food safety structure across our globe. All of those things lead to uh, the potential for either misunderstanding and or, or misinterpretation. And that's another role that ag literacy can help to fulfill, to grasp the, the complexity of agri-food systems, but to also understand the simplicity of outcomes to produce safe, nutritious, sustainable food that people can use across the globe. That's a very simple concept. Uh, but the fact is that the broader agri-food system does have thousands of, of different players, of different elements, and we have to understand that as we approach uh, the development of ag literacy uh, in our friends, in our colleagues, in citizens across the globe. The fourth aspect that I want to bring out is the idea of technology change. One of the things that makes the agri-food sector so exciting is the whole area of new technology, of new opportunities. And with that comes, in some cases, technologies that maybe people have some questions about. And we know that the agri-food sector has struggled in the case of transgenic technologies. There are now ongoing discussions about the use of nanotechnology in the food system. We're starting to go down the road of cellular agriculture and precision fermentation. Some of these things uh, make people wonder about what's the state of their food system. Uh, you know, they're under the impression that, uh, uh, you know, food is produced by animals and crops on family farms with very simple processing that we did centuries ago of boiling and cooking and salting and pickling. Uh, but there are new things and new opportunities that are available. And that increases the level of questions, I think, that citizens across the globe can have with respect to the agri-food system and 
clearly that becomes an element of ag literacy. And that really leads to the, the fifth comment with respect to science literacy in total. As we have seen in certain parts of the world, there's even a movement towards anti-intellectualism or a suspicion of people that have deep technical knowledge in very specific areas. So this is not only an issue of ag literacy, it's a broader issue of the scientific literacy of our, again, friends, colleagues, collaborators, citizens across the world. How do we work from a base of maybe very limited knowledge of appreciation of science, of the scientific method, all of these things we need to consider. And lastly, I would just say that we have had issues within our food system with respect to food recalls, with respect to food safety issues. And all of this perhaps undercuts the, uh, the trust that people have in the systems that, uh, that are providing their food. And, you know, it seems like the nature of human beings right now is uh, is to question uh, the systems that we work in, uh, groups uh, and uh, and uh, and full support systems that uh, just went with a, a general idea of trust in the past. Now a lot of that is being held up uh, uh, into a very bright light, and I think that ag literacy is something that can certainly help us to get back to the center where citizens understand what we we're doing. They have confidence in what we're doing. Uh, and in fact, they're proud to be part of a much broader system. So let's just talk a little bit about definitions. I know all of us probably have a sense of some of the things that are going on here, but I think it's important for us to root uh, ourselves in some of the concepts that people have talked about the, in the US. And that's the reason the, for the uh, uh, the reference to Americans in the definition itself talked about a definition of agricultural literacy as understanding of the food and fiber system, including its history and current economic, social, and environmental significance to all Americans. This definition encompasses some knowledge of food and fiber production, processing, and international marketing. And then it even talks a little bit more in uh, sort of the element that supports the definition of achieving the goal of agricultural literacy, which will produce informed citizens who are able to participate in establishing the policies that will support a competitive agricultural industry in this country and abroad. So already you see the aspect of confidence, of informing people, of actually having individuals that are qualified to start to make comments with respect to ag policy of regulatory frameworks. Uh, so that came out in 1988. Martin Frick uh, was one of the early people that was involved in thinking about agricultural literacy. He published a PhD uh, in this area and then a number of subsequent papers with respect to ag literacy. I won't read that uh, one to you, but I think you get a sense as you work through this definition that there are some key aspects there with respect to knowledge and understanding. Again, this much broader food system that we think about, not just all of the uh, independent pieces that make up that system. There's always a reference to an understanding of the, the issues and the elements of production, but also the important economic impact uh, of the agri-food sector and another piece of the literacy that makes so much more sense. And then there is, a, again, that reference to understanding the, the reason and perhaps even the influence of agricultural policies. And I, I like that last phrase that talks about the global significance of agriculture and the distribution of agricultural products. So understanding that this is a, a global opportunity that is really part and parcel of who we are. There's a slightly more uh, updated version that Meishen and Trexler uh, have worked on. Again, I won't read the entire uh, definition. Uh, you'll just see that there are, uh, you know, a few uh, uh, nuances that have been introduced into this uh, definition, but again, very much system focused thinking about someone that can actually articulate 
how the agriculture and food system works, even if they are living in a condominium on the 14th floor of a major urban center, that they just grasp what's going on in the agri-food sector, <clears throat> really become both uh, knowledgeable about uh, the agri-food sector, and maybe even almost to the point of being advocates for the agri-food sector itself. Just a couple more definitions. Uh, um, this one actually makes reference uh, to what the IAAS uh, talks about uh, in this area. Uh, a much shorter definition, but talking about the practice and insightful knowledge of food, fiber, and energy systems as impacted by diverse factors of economic, social, and environmental decisions that consumers make for their food, fiber, and fuel choices. So perhaps uh, the simplest one, but I think it's important for us uh, to consider um, what all of the aspects of ag literacy um, actually uh, incorporates. And perhaps just one more that I will include for you as well uh, is here in the area that Settle It All developed in 2017. And they talk very specifically about the fact that the public lacks knowledge and connectedness to agriculture and natural resources in the United States. Again, this was the jurisdiction where they were working, leading to the need for effective communications from agricultural and natural resource management organizations. And here is the key aspect. Trust is an integral component of communications, but it is not well understood how the public trusts the various organizations communicating agricultural and natural resource issues. And really this is the next step in what I want to, to speak about. This is not only the issue of uh, literacy itself, but how do we connect to the groups where we want uh, them to enhance their knowledge of the agri-food system, that they would have some understanding of what that agri-food system is. And of course, the baseline for all of this has to be with citizens and really consumers of products across the globe. We know that there are all the issues that I brought up, that uh, people have concerns, that they have issues around scientific literacy and all the rest, but we have to figure out how to make a direct contact with these groups. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the specific groups that we need to think about when it comes to ag literacy. But really, this is a question that makes us think about how are we going to engage with people? What are those tools? I'm sure you're all very familiar with these bullets. I'm sure that you think a lot about and probably participate in sending a message, uh, articulating a point of view by using these tools. But let's just think about them in the context of agricultural literacy. Social media. We know now that whether it's TikTok or Twitter or Instagram, Facebook, different groups participate across these uh, various platforms. Messaging has to be packaged in different ways. In some cases, there are opportunities to make a very direct connection. For me as a researcher and a dean, I work uh, use social media uh, a great deal to engage with all of those audiences that I want to work with, that I want to uh, coordinate with for them to understand what we are doing. And of course, the messages have to be tailored in each one of those situations. A TikTok video, obviously very different from uh, sending out a note about a new source of funding or a new initiative uh, for a research activity within our faculty that we will announce on Twitter. And of course, in the cases of things like Instagram, where it's much more personal that I'm taking a selfie uh, with part of our graduating class at convocation, so again, just using these tools in a way uh, that starts to build on the message that we want to deliver. In the case of ag literacy, we have to think very seriously about why do people uh, sign on to social media? What are they really looking for? What maybe will um, change their mind or give them the information that they need um, when they are uh, actively involved in some of these social media, uh, social media platforms? And of course, they also bring some 
real issues and concerns that we need to think about when misinformation or maybe misunderstandings are also uh, placed uh, in uh, social media platforms. So we need to think about all of those aspects. What are those tools that are available to us to build um, uh, the kind of ag literacy that citizens will benefit from? The internet, I mean, this is the standard one. Uh, how many you know, young people actually go to web pages now. I'm not so sure. I think most groups do a good job of uh, laying out information uh, on internet-based uh, websites. Uh, but is that really connecting to some of the communities that we're interested in? Can some of the communities even uh, engage and, and, and link to? Do they have uh, connectivity? I know even here in Western Canada, rural populations really struggle with appropriate levels of connectivity. So all of that has to be taken into account of as well. Of course, we all do public events, uh, uh, whether it's actually creating panels, debates, even these uh, this, this uh, online uh, uh, discussion that we are gonna have around ag literacy. Maybe that's one of the more traditional approaches and that works for certain communities or certain subsets of groups that we want to contact. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't underplay the importance of uh, some of those activities. And we wanna be as transparent as possible. As a faculty, we have all kinds of open houses showing our research, introducing people to our, our research scientists, to our professors and our graduate students. All of that is key to what it is that we want to do. Third-party communication, sometimes the most compelling message is not the one that you give about yourself, but someone that talks about your work in a very compelling way, someone that is seen as neutral or seen as some uh, someone that has a, an excellent reputation that people trust. It's great to have someone else talk about the work that you do, and certainly that comes into play when we think about agricultural literacy. Uh, and you know there are some new things, the idea of MOOCs, uh, these massive open online courses here at the University of Alberta, we have one around uh, people understanding all aspects of indigenous peoples this has been taken by hundreds of thousands of people, and it really does seem to have changed the discussion, not only here in Alberta or Canada or around the world, as people get new information and in thinking about all of the aspects of our relationships with Indigenous people here within Canada and beyond. And then I guess I would just reference those other traditional means of television, of radio, uh, of having uh, uh, information delivered in newspapers. But, uh, you know, I guess I just want to put a little bit of an asterisk there. I think the number of people that these traditional uh, channels uh, are reaching, I think will continue to diminish over time, just as we've saw all of the things that are going on. So in all of these tools, and I will just restate it again, this is really about developing a trusting relationship, not only to provide the information that we are trying to bring across when it comes to increasing the agricultural literacy of whoever our audience might be, but also just in that trust of our overall system, something that I think um, you know, has had some real challenges over the last 10 or 15 years for some of the reasons that I have outlined. So. I've laid this groundwork for how do we convince citizens, how do we convince our friends, our neighbors, all of those people that are around us, all the way up to those 8 billion people around the world. But I think we also need to consider that there are specific groups that we should think about. What do we do about elected officials? Once we'd have that base of knowledge around production and processing and the the interesting supply chains that have developed within agri-food and the richness of the people uh, 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 with respect to their abilities and their commitment to safe, sustainable, uh, uh, healthy food. Um, our elected officials, we need to keep reinforcing that message. We have to remind them of the key aspects of the economic benefit of the jobs that are associated with uh, all things agri-food, uh, because these are the the aspects that I think will really ring true to them when they start uh, considering decisions around legislation or support or new investment and in new opportunities to grow our sector. In the same way, I think about regulatory officials. Uh, many of these people do not have a significant uh, understanding of the agri-food sector. We have to work very hard in 
uh, providing new uh, opportunities for them to understand uh, how careful the agri-food system has been established, all of the checks and balances that support that production of sustainable, uh, uh, safe food. Uh, we have to just work harder with some of these groups to make sure that the, the very essential points that help them to do their jobs come across in addition to that baseline of agricultural literacy that I was talking about earlier. True of the media, I've already uh, mentioned them. You know, what drives a media story? We have to think about what will actually capture the attention of media. How is it that we can use their uh, interests and their resources to try to send messages that are positive about the agri-food sector? Uh, I know sometimes our colleagues don't want to engage with media because uh, they're afraid that there will be some sort of a gotcha moment uh, uh, with respect to some aspect of the technology. In my experience, media want to tell uh, an exciting story, a story that's going to show impact on the health of their viewers or their readers. And I think we have a lot of great stories. And I would really suggest that in this case, we think about um, uh, uh, capturing those stories of articulating the stories that media really want uh, to tell and that will show agriculture and food in a very good light. What about the younger generation of students that are coming through our system? Here in the province of Alberta, we're developing a new curriculum. How can we incorporate the ideas of the importance of the agri-food sector, the commitment to safety, to animal welfare, to all of those issues that especially some students may have some real concerns about? We need to be as transparent as we possibly can be, as honest as we possibly can be, but show that we are also moving the dial, that the things that might have been true 15 or 20 years ago are different now, but making that connection to K to 12 students is absolutely critical. In the same way, I've referenced this already, but I think urban citizens are a very specific group. They may be three, four, five generations removed from the agriculture and food sector. Um, all citizens, but certainly what we, the, what we see in urban environments we see a whole new set of retail uh, opportunities, new products that are being developed. We've seen the move towards uh, flexitarian and so many other diets, the demand for new products and plant protein and others. We need to be able to explain that we're not only producing the commodities that we've done for the last 100 years, but that we are being responsive, not only to the new products that people are looking for, but to be doing this work in a way that aligns with the personal values of citizens, and especially people that live in urban environments that are so far away from agriculture that they just have no other um, uh, touchstone. They have no other uh, way to actually even understand what the agri-food sector is really trying to accomplish. So again, a very specific group with uh, uh, very uh, specific targets when it comes to what we might do in ag literacy. And I wondered about putting this in, but I will I will articulate it. I think we have to work with our own agricultural producers. Sometimes, uh, and I have grown up, my, my family is involved in agriculture. I think we sometimes think if we just tell people often enough or loudly enough that we're doing great things, that somehow that's going to move the bar on agricultural literacy. What I do see are those agricultural producers that engage with social media, that make themselves available at public events, where they talk about the work that they do to ensure the sustainability of their, uh, their production facilities, how they take care of their farms, how they manage and, and do everything in their power to keep the highest quality of water in the way that they take care of soil. So I think we need to connect to those groups that when we're talking about ag literacy in this particular case, it's how we really do tell our stories to the rest of the world because agricultural producers have a high level of trust when people uh, do surveys around this sort of thing, quite different from what I'll talk about in a moment or two with respect to the private sector. And here it is, you know, the there's the, uh, the Edelman barometer uh, that actually goes around and does uh, surveys of citizens around the world on who do they trust. They do trust producers, farmers, 
um, there's a lower level of trust for the private sector, especially in some areas, and, and agri-food can be some of them, although in other areas, there, there still is an understanding that people uh, uh, working within the private sector are committed to uh, a great experience that, that uh, citizens have when they, when they eat the food that is produced. But the private sector has to think about what messages does it want to send? I'm not sure it can make um, you know, the entire case for the entire uh, uh, supply chain, but I think talking about the values of the company, talking about what kind of investments that they're making in the safety of their workers, in the case of uh, where animals are involved, uh, uh, animal welfare uh, uh, innovations uh, that have brought into place. So in the case of the private sector that's involved in the agri-food space, just to pick those those topics uh, uh, that they really can be compelling in, and that citizens will uh, will uh, take them at their word for uh, what it is that they are that they are describing. Uh, and I guess I would just uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, leave the last two thinking about university students across our campus. We have forty thousand students. How do we bring them up to speed? Because many of them do not have a direct relationship. I, I'm not talking about students within our own faculty, but they certainly become emissaries when we hold public events, when we uh, talk about the work that's going on within our undergraduate and graduate programs. Uh, that's an aspect that we want to take advantage of. University students question many things. They're also thinking about the possibility of careers that align with their personal values. All of this has to be built into the, the whole idea of, uh, of agricultural literacy. And the last group that I would point out is uh, ourselves, the, the community of, of, of agri-food researchers, professors, uh, postdoctoral scientists. Uh, you know, sometimes we think if we want to make the case that people have to understand the agri-food sector, if we just give one more binder of evidence, one more binder of data, that somehow that will move uh, uh, the dial on what people think about the agri-food sector. I would just come back again to the idea of telling stories, of finding ways that we can actually communicate that we uh, work that we do that aligns with the values of citizens, that we're trying to increase the health, the opportunity uh, for economic growth within uh, the sector. These might be some of the stories that are more compelling to citizens. So, I'm just gonna sum up by saying, really this comes down to relationships that are built on trust. The tools uh, that we use, the relationships that we build, all of these things are focused on trust. And you know these things as well as I do, the need to be authentic, to understand the, the needs and the, and the motivation of specific groups, some of which I have outlined for you, to actually know how to reach them, how do they learn, how do they acquire new information. That's our responsibility to be able to make those connections. And of course, communication that respects citizens and, and listens to their concerns. Uh, if people are telling us that they have real worries about the agri-food sector, it's not just for us to say, don't worry about this. We need to listen. Sometimes we need to admit that we've done things in a way that has not always been optimal in the past, and to show that trajectory that we're working hard to correct issues that have been uh, of, of major concern in the past, and to show that upward trend of opportunity, uh, and of course, to create channels for dialogue. So I would just leave us uh, with that. And you know, when I think about all of this work in the frame of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, it brings me to think about all of the ways that we can communicate with citizens so that there will be investments in innovation, that there will actually be knowledge transfer of new innovations that are actually gonna make people's lives better. And that is gonna be what actually uh, allows us to reach those sustainable development goals that we have set for ourselves across the entire world. And I would just leave you with uh, uh, a couple of thoughts uh, uh, first of all, from uh, from Bill Gates when he was speaking about uh, uh, some time ago about the the role of agriculture, and really he's saying that it's very much an opportunity across the world when he's thinking about uh, uh, their investments of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, in emerging economies um, that agriculture and food can be a real engine of economic development, a source of social cohesion. 
And uh, a good friend of this faculty, a good friend of mine, uh, the current president of the African Development Bank, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Akina Dashina, talking about a place like Africa, where it has all that it needs to win in agriculture. And, uh, you know, his his use of that word win was really about enhancing the lives of families, of increasing their health status, of creating uh, the wealth that will allow uh, educational opportunities for the next generation, not only of uh, agricultural uh, producers, but people across the spectrum within uh, uh, jurisdictions, uh, countries, and otherwise. So there's a real opportunity that presents itself for us. I hope I've made a compelling case that ag literacy is critical. We have to take a critical view of how we will introduce ag literacy. And really, this is about establishing trust at every level to be able to deliver that message about the importance of agriculture and food, about its the impact of agriculture and food, and about that future opportunity that exists that we need to take advantage of when it comes to the agri-food sector. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you taking uh, the time to listen to me today. Take care. Bye-bye.